Good morning. My name is Cardin Rogers. I'm the Vice Provost and Director of Libraries here at Penn. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning. If you're not here for the Science of Information, 1870 to 1945, the universal, uh, I can't say it, uh, universalization of knowledge in a utopian age conference, you've wandered into the wrong hall. Um, the Penn Library is very proud to be partnering with our good friends, the Beckman Center at the Chemical Heritage Foundation uh, in sponsoring this terrific conference. My good friend Ron Brashear in the back of the room. Um, thanks very much to them for, uh, for being our co-sponsors. A special shout out and thanks to the conference organizers, Robert Fox from Oxford University, Evan Hepler Smith from Harvard, and my extraordinary Penn colleague, Lynn Ransom, to whom we, both the Royal and Collective We, owe so much. So thanks to them for, for pulling this all together. <laughs> this conference highlights the continuing quests of humans to universalize information while making it freely accessible, and the role that information science, and by extension, libraries, play in those ongoing efforts. Unfortunately, many of our fellow human beings, including most Penn students, think that they have reached the memory alpha of university, universal knowledge. That's a Star Trek reference for anybody who's keeping track. Um, every time they do a Google search, trying to get them to understand that searching Google or any other major search engine only brings back a small percentage of information that might be relevant to their search while much more lies beneath the surface, surface waiting to be discovered is challenging for librarians and faculty alike. While the conference focuses on the period from 1870 to 1945, its themes have relevance in today's world, perhaps even more so in a world that seems, uh, at least to me, to be becoming more dystopian in so many ways, where facts are not facts, where ignorance is seen as a strength, and where information, particularly scientific information, is not only ridiculed and ignored, in some quarters it is actively destroyed. Uh, parenthetically, as many of you may know, perhaps you don't, the Penn Libraries have been heavily involved in what's called the Data Refuge Project, which seeks to collect and preserve data from government, governmental agencies that is at risk of disappearing. So what, what's happening today at a governmental level seems at such odds with the work of visionaries like Paul Oatley that informs much of what you will be discussing over the next couple of days. And it reminds us of the critical role libraries have always played in the information life cycle, from helping to fuel the creation of new knowledge to preserving it and making it available for reuse. The period under discussion at this conference really does mark the beginning of the history of modern information science. Obviously, this is what brings us all together and why, is, why it is appropriate, right and just, as they say, that a portion of the conference is being held here in the Fisher Fine Arts Library. This magnificent library was designed by the Philadelphia architect Frank Furness and opened its doors in 1891. February 7th, actually, uh, 126 years ago. The library room that had served the university so well for the first hundred some odd years of uh, its existence no longer sufficed, and the trustees set out uh, to build a library that they hoped would serve the university for another hundred years. As this was a period where information science informed the development of modern librarianship, the trustees realized they needed to bring in some experts to help with the planning for this new state-of-the-art library. I'm reading from the dedication pamphlet. At the very outset of our task in devising plans for the future building, we were deeply impressed with the necessity of such a mastery of all the details of library management as only a librarian could know. And we therefore invoke the aid of those eminent librarians Mr. Justin Windsor of Harvard College, and Mr. Melville Dewey, then of Columbia College, to both whom be here, publicly tendered our most grateful thanks for their generous interest 
and the unstinted gift to us of the fruits of their ripe experience. Uh, very 19th century prose. Interestingly enough, you, you don't hear the pen librarian mentioned as being consulted. Um, so that's pretty typical, right? A prophet everywhere but at home. Um, the speaker was Horace Howard Furness, who happened to be Frank Furness's brother. And um, Horace Howard Furness went on to say, which I thought was pretty funny, our architect, whom it does not beseem me to praise, and who needs no praise of mine, <laughs> proceeded at once to give these needs a form and habitation. However, Furness, Dewey, and Windsor were all aware that the desire and need to grow print collections, to spread the collecting net far and wide in attempt, futile even then, to collect a large swath of human knowledge in support of a growing university, necessitated a design that could accommodate significant and sustained growth, both in terms of space and accessibility. Again, from the dedication. Here in the book stack, the problem has been triumphantly solved of the greatest, of the great possible light, of an equable temperature and of absolute indestructibility. Its indestructibility is assured in that it is built entirely of bricks, iron, and glass. Nothing but a cataclysm that will turn Earth's base to stubble can harm it or its contents. Its glass roof catches every ray of heaven's light and pours it into every nook and corner. There is not a crevice of that book stack wherein the smallest type may not be read as easily as anywhere. There is room in it, in its present state, for about 300,000 books. And when this number is stored there, a consummation from present, present indications not so far, very far off, the rear wall can be taken down and the stack indefinitely prolonged. No pent up book stack need contract our powers. The whole boundless campus here is ours. <laughs> Thus there is a provision for the present and prevision for the future. And our whole building may stand as a model of the happy employment of means to ends. In an unhappy postscript, in, 2000 and uh, 2000, in 1915, 24 short years later, the university decided it needed office space and it built uh, a wing to this building, uh, the During Wing, and by so doing effectively stopped the boundless campus in its tracks. Uh, a reminder that utopian dreams often die at the hands of our so-called friends. Uh, but circling back to the theme of this conference, what were Furness, Dewey, Windsor, and Penn officials hoping to achieve in 1891 with this magnificent building? As I said, it wasn't to collect all the world's knowledge. They knew they couldn't do that. But this is what Penn's provost at the time, William Pepper, had to say in his remarks about how he viewed what was happening in this, or was going to happen in this building. Around these great collections already centered, center important associations, which invite the cooperation of all interested in the development and extension of science, of art, and of literature. The pulses of life, which beat full and steady in these chambers of learning, will spread far and wide, and will carry strength and healing in their course. As an evidence of the fidelity and liberality with which the University of Pennsylvania aims to discharge the many and weighty obligations deliberately assumed as a symbol of the large and free spirit which it is hoped will always animate this institution, we accept this noble library. So the Furness Library, now, now uh, expanded, uh, or, uh, the Collections at Penn ex expanded well outside of the walls of this facility. We have the Van Pelt Dietrich Library Center and many other physical instantiations of libraries around, uh, around Penn's campus. And they all still play that essential role and are both symbol and driver of that large and free spirit which still animates this university. Libraries of Learning, Landmark and Lighthouse at once recording the past 
and lighting the pathless future. So thanks again for being here this morning. Uh, I hope you uh, uh, have an opportunity to take a tour of this building, read all the uh, sayings on the windows that surround, um, surround the grand reading room. Um, if you have a free minute or two, please come over and see the Van Pelt Dietrich Library Center. It's really uh, has become a, quite a terrific modern research library. Uh, and thanks again for inviting me, Lynn, uh, to do this welcome. And I hope you have a really terrific conference. So thanks. So thank you, Carton, for that wonderful introduction um, to uh, today's uh, conference. Um, I just want to give a few thanks uh, to people who are involved. As if you've ever organized a conference like this, you know that there are many people uh, involved who um, make it run smoothly, um, provide us with the necessities of coffee and tea and pastries and that sort of thing. Um, but my first thanks uh, go to my co-organizers, Robert and Evan, and it's their expertise and knowledge of the field that have made this program possible. They've indulgently invited me into their sandbox, and I've loved every minute and will be forever uh, grateful for the experience. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank the Chemical Heritage Foundation for kicking off the conference uh, with Michael Gordon's excellent keynote talk last night. If you were not uh, there, um, I'm sorry, it was a wonderful talk. Um, and it was a, it was a, a great event to start um, the conference. Um, I want to thank our funders, uh, the Thomas Sovereign Gates Library Lecture Fund uh, from the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, the Center for Global Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and the Gladys Creeble Dumas Foundation. Without all of this uh, support, none of this would, have, would be happening. Um, I want to thank uh, the Kleinman Center for Energy Policy for letting us use this beautiful and historically appropriate space, and Bill Cohen. Uh, who, uh, who made this happen. Um, I want to thank my uh, graduate student assistant, Zachary Lev, who was funded by the Delmas Foundation and has been an excellent uh, addition to this process. And he is somewhere, oh, here he is. So if you have any questions, um, he's, he's a very good person to ask, as well as, as myself. Um, I want to thank uh, my colleagues at the Kislak Center for their general support, especially Betsy Bates, Eddie Mizukani, and Tom Hensel. Uh, the event coordinator, Alita Arthurs, who provides the coffee and the pastries and the reception um, that will take place tomorrow night, to which everyone is invited. Our IT coordinator, Doug Smollins, um, who I don't think is here right now, so if there's a problem, it's his fault, not mine. <laughs> Hopefully there's not a problem. Um, which reminds me, we're recording this event um, with the speaker's permission. Um, all the cameras are pointed at the speaker, so if you, uh, you none of, no one in the audience will be recorded um, unless you ask a question. Uh, finally, I want to thank the uh, moderators uh, who have volunteered their time from the Penn Libraries, from the Chemical Heritage Foundation, from the School of Arts and Sciences departments of History and Sociology of Science and the English Department. Um, and then last, but in no way least, I want to thank the speakers, many of whom who have come, have come from very far to be here and braved US border security, um, uh, hopefully without a hitch. Um, Robert, Evan, and I are extremely grateful of and honored by your time and commitment. So I'm going to now turn it over to the moderator of our first session, Projit Bihari Mukherjee uh, from the Department of History and Sociology of Science at Penn to introduce our first speakers. Our next speaker is Geert uh, Somsen. He's currently a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Columbia um, in New York, but he's also attached to Maastricht University uh, in um, and the Max Planck, uh, sorry, he's between three universities, so, uh, so it's a, a little difficult keeping track of where Geert is at, but Geert's been working on uh, roughly uh, similar ideas as what we heard, but from a very different angle. He's interested in science and universalism, ideas about uh, science and uh, the world order. 
He's the author of two edited volumes in English and a couple of monographs in Dutch. Uh, but today he's going to talk to us about um, unscathed universalism, scientific internationalism through the, I'm going to butcher this, Krieg der Gellerton? Sorry, I butchered that, but over to Gary. Thank you very much, Projit. Uh, thank you, organizers, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I have to apologize for my rather confusing uh, affiliations. Um, I sometimes feel a little bit like a rootless cosmopolitan myself, uh, being pretty homeless over the last three years. But I will, in the end, uh, as of this summer, settle back again in Maastricht, the Netherlands, which has been my home for a little while now. Um, I arrived to the United States uh, the day before yesterday, and I had indeed passed to pass through immigration, and I was confronted with a rather harsh immigration officer who asked what I was here for, and I said, for a, for a conference. And he said, what's the conference about? And I said, the sciences of information, which I'm not totally sure how he interpreted that, whether that was a reason to let me in or to be very suspicious of my activities here. And maybe he thought, that's our business, what we are doing. Uh, anyway, I, I hasten to add that it was a history of science conference. And that sort of convinced him, because then he started talking about Benjamin Franklin and how he admired him, etc. So <laughs> I got to pass through. Anyway, it's not for this reason, but my talk will not be so much emphasized on what Alex just talked about, namely the science of cataloging and information, etc., but a little bit more about the other dimension of this conference, namely universalist and internationalist ideals. I'm, uh, I'm presenting this particular paper for the first time, so it's fresh research. For the re that reason, I'm not going to speak as freely, but I've written down my argument to start off with a solid first version, I hope. The, um, the split in international scientific uh, relations that started during the First World War uh, is pretty well known and has been the subject of innumerable studies in the history and sociology of science. As scholars from Brigitte schroeder goedehus through Michael Gordon have shown, the, war, the First World War produced a rift in institutional, at practical and at personal levels that would affect the world of science for years to come. But even though many aspects of the Krieg der Gelehrten, the War of the Scholars, it is often called, and its aftermath after the First World War, even though those aspects are increasingly well understood, they still hold a paradox, I believe, that is not yet resolved. For why is that exactly when international cooperation was officially suspended through institutions like the International Research Council, the rhetoric that celebrated the universal and fraternizing nature of science re-emerged? as if no such divisions were taking place. How is it that George Sarton, the Belgian historian of science, founder of the field, whose beloved Belgium was one of the prime movers in cutting off German and Austrian scientists after 1919, could declare at the same time that, I quote, the domain of science is the privileged domain of internationalism, and that the unity of knowledge and the unity of mankind are two sides of the same coin. How could the League of Nations International Committee of Intellectual Cooperation, that we're going to hear quite a lot about during this conference, how could that committee, that was one of the very embodiments of the boycott of the central powers, of intellectuals from Germany and Austria, how could it declare its moral aim to be the realization of a great ideal of fraternity, of solidarity, of accord among men? An accord, moreover, that was to be more easily attained in high intellectual spheres from which it could progressively descend upon the nations. Statements like these repeated the old ideal of the Republic of Letters, the community of the learned transcending and uniting all nationalities, at the same time that they ignored the blatant fact that such community no longer existed since the war. Hence, most historians, perhaps wisely, have more or less ignored these expressions, unreflective as they seem to be of the actual reality of exclusion and division on the ground. Brigitte Schroeder has, in fact, paid attention to these expressions, but only to dismiss them, to dismiss, dismiss their internationalist rhetoric, rhetoric as disingenuous, if not reprehensible. 
I propose a different way of understanding the post-war, oh, sorry, I skipped my first slide, which is the home of the International Institute, uh, sorry, the International Committee of Intellectual Cooperation. I propose a different way of understanding the post-war internationalist discourse, but tracing its roots back to the war itself. For even though many scientists of the belligerent countries turned to heavily chauvinistic expressions after 1914, internationalist rhetoric by no means vanished and was in fact wedded, as we shall see, to nationalist expressions. I'll try to show this by following the statements of the French philosopher Henri Bergson, one of Europe's most prominent public intellectuals of his time, as well as the chairman during the first three years of its existence of the International Committee of, on Intellectual Cooperation. When the war broke out in August 1914, Bergson was, among other things, president of the Académie des Sciences Morales et Politiques, the Academy of Moral and Political Sciences in Paris. This academy met a mere four days after the German invasion of Belgium, at which occasion Bergson declared his admiration and gratitude for the Belgian defensive struggle against the German invasion, as well as his unrestrained dedication to the French war cause. The war against Germany, Bergson stated, is the war of civilization against barbarism. This, he added, was not merely a patriotic statement, but a message that had special significance um, coming from the academy. Everybody senses, he said, uh, that the war was a war of civilization against barbarism, but our academy has perhaps a special authority in saying so. It is simply doing its scientific duty when observing that in its brutality and cynicism, in its contempt of all justice and all truth, Germany has fallen back to a savage state. This kind of message would continue to be Bergson's general response to the war. Throughout the war years, he would repeatedly speak to newspapers, give lectures, or write articles that restated this fairly typical and perhaps fairly unremarkable perspective. Germany had fallen into barbarity. France and its allies were defending civilization. Already by the end of 1914, Bergson did work out this perspective in a more comprehensive philosophical analysis that was in line with his earlier philosophical writings, uh, his, his vitalist philosophical writings. Bergson, after all, as you may know, was the philosopher of Elan Vital, the, the principle that was characteristic of life. Such an analysis of the war, Bergson said, was in fact rather simple. And here's the book that he published it in. Um, a little history will suffice. Sorry, here's the book. Sorry, a little history and a little philosophy will suffice to do the job. Bergson's interpretation started from a historical account of the development of Germany, which had begun quite normally, but had increasingly come under the sway of Prussia. And Prussia was, to Bergson, a highly mechanical state. Its administration was like a clockwork, its army was a machine, and its citizens were drilled to mechanical obedience. Later on, Prussia's militarism was being accompanied by an equally mechanical industrialism, and its entire value system was based on depreciation of force alone. Ethically, this meant that might is right, Bergson stated, hence the ruthlessness in conquest for its own sake that was so characteristic of Prussia and later of Germany as a whole, and that was now displayed during the war. Throughout his essay, Bergson juxtaposed the mechanical to the organic, the determined to the spontaneous, to creativity, to growth and freedom, precisely those principles essential to his conception of elan vital, the subtle impulse he deemed characteristic of life itself. His essay's subtitle, Life and Matter in Conflict, summed up his analysis of what the entire war was about mechanical materialism versus uh, a society characterized by life. But while matter and the mechanical were represented by Germany, life and the organic did not stand for France. 
they were part of a normal civilization at any place, at least in a sufficiently advanced state of civilization. His book was therefore a straightforward rejection of German culture, but by no means, it, no means a defense of French civilization per se. It applied to a general, potential, uni, potentially universal state of affairs. Note, by the way, as a little uh, um, interjection, that Bergson's characterization of uh, German, German culture and French civilization more or less was the reversal of what is the common characterization, like of culture versus civilization, where the French, you know, in the German eyes, where the French stand for the mechanical and the rationalist, etc., and the German for something organic and, and deeply felt. It's almost the same picture, except for it was the, the Canadas have switched places. Anyway, as the British philosopher H. Wilden Carr wrote in the preface to Bergson's philosophical analysis of the world, were the discourse by Mr. Bergson no more than the utterance of a philosopher stirred by deep, stirred by deep patriotic feeling to uphold his country's cause and to denounce his country's foes, then it would have no significance or value. But it has a much deeper meaning. It's no mere indictment of Germans, Germany's rulers or people. It goes to the very heart of the problem of the future of humanity. Humanity was what, it, was what was at stake here. The war against Germany was a defense of universal civilization. Now, writing a book was one thing, but mobilizing its analysis to make it play an active role in international politics was quite another. But by early 19... 17, however, Bergson got a chance to do so at a large scale when he was invited to join a delegation of French academics that the French prime minister was sending to the United States to persuade the American public and possibly the American government that the country should enter the global conflict on the Allied side. Remember that America is still neutral at this point. For more than three months, Bergson toured the country, speaking to various notable people, giving interviews to newspapers, and addressing all kinds of clubs, societies, and academies. To spread his vision of the war as a defense of universal civilization against German barbarism. It was, he told an audience in New York, a holy war that was being fought, not for king and country, as the Brits would have it, nor for Blut and Boden, as the Germans would later have it, but for the civilized world as a whole. When Marshal Joffre had stopped the German armies at the Marne, he had not just saved his nation, but he had rescued universal civilization. Bergson also got to speak to various uh, government officials. And he got on pretty close terms with some of them, probably aided by his impeccable English. Uh, Bergson was actually a native speaker in English because he had, he had an English mother and he had lived for his first, the first nine years of his life in Britain. Bergson got especially close to Colonel House, President Wilson's right-hand man. Uh, here we see House, and here we see House, together with Wilson. In these conversations, Bergson related the same reading of the global conflict that he had ventured elsewhere. And we know from House's own diary um, that he wholeheartedly agreed with his French interlocutor. This was not so much because House shared Bergson's vitalist philosophy, but first and foremost because the image of the war as the defense of universal civilization presents the justification for American entry into the conflict, an entry that, House thought, had become all but inevitable at that moment. Such a justification was not only morally necessary, but also politically imperative, as broad swath of the American population need to be convinced of the sanctity of the sacrifice. Bergson and House agreed that a mere retaliation to German submarine attacks might not gain the same moral advantage as a reason to go to war. America, they agreed, would have a more beautiful role, I quote, in the eyes of the world, if she would declare war, proclaiming that she's fighting for the same higher principles that the French are fighting for, namely universal civilization. On April 2nd, with Bergson still being in the United States, President Wilson announced American entry into the war before a consenting Congress. 
what you see happening here. Now, of course, it would be pretty ridiculous to suppose that it was Bergson's lobbying that had convinced the American president to take this decision, but interpretations of what the war was and what it was being fought for did, in fact, play an important role in the process that led to this decision. Wilson's direct entourage, and probably the president himself, had long been convinced that the, that the US should enter the fight on the Allied side. But what Wilson still needed was the right kind of legitimation that would render this move as morally right and publicly convincing. Some compelling, some compelling candidate legitimations presented themselves in early 1917. Germany's resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare, for example, sinking American civilian ships. And also the disclosure of the famous Zimmerman telegram promising, with Germany promising parts of the United States to Mexico if they would win the war. But even more important, especially to Wilson himself, was a rendering of the situation that pictured the US not as just another belligerent defending its own interests, but as a country in a superior role standing above the European parties. Wilson did not want to associate necessarily as France or Britain, but seen as a, as a third superior party. In Wilson's eyes, America should not be one of the allies, but represent a higher universal civilization. It was to this picture that stories such as Bergson's analysis of the war contributed. And it was in fact only when Wilson had such a story ready that he decided to throw in his lot. Bergson's analysis of the war, not as the fight of particular nation, nations, but as a defense of universal civilization, directly fed into what would, be, would become the dominant discourse American, accompanying America's role in the war from 1917 on, and in fact into the Versailles negotiations, where Wilson was seen as such a sort of superior uh, politician, uh, chairing above the, uh, the former belligerents. However, it must be said that the US and France were not the only countries to bruise the defense of civilization as a leading definition of their war course. Several Belgians, for example, came up with similar accounts of what the conflict was about. At the same time that Bergson was lobbying, George Sarton, the historian of science, was contributing comparable stories to the American public debate. Sarton was also in the United States during the First World War. In his case, in Sarton's case, though, it was Belgium that had saved the world from falling into barbarism by halting the German hordes, while in Bergson's version, it was the French who had rescued humankind by, at the, the Battle of the Marne. But, more interestingly, also intellectuals from neutral countries produced accounts of, the sim, of a similar kind. According to several Swedes and Dutchmen, it was the neutrals who were preserving universal civilization as all of the belligerents on either side of the conflict has lo had lost their rational minds in the fog of war, had become passionist, chauvinists, and therefore lost sight and uh, lost the, the care of universal civilization. Only neutrals could save European country, uh, culture from itself, as it were. Finally, even German academics described their war as, a def as defending not just their country, but also universal civilization, international law, and world peace against the assaults made upon these things by Britain and France. That, at least, is what the notorious manifesto to the civilized world, the Aufruf of the 93 of October 1914, tried to argue, credibly or not, but that is what it was trying to do, hence its title, to the civilized world. And so Bergson's philosophical rendering of the war was by no means unique, at least in this dimension. It's a stress on universal civilization. No, no means unique, unique at all. But what did make it a little bit special was that it would become the winner's version, uh, or part of the winner's version. After all, it was the victorious power's view of higher civilization, and not that of the neutrals or of the Germans, which won the day, and which was translated right into the Paris treaties, punishing Germany, etc and institutionalized in the League of Nations and its accompanying organizations, excluding the Germans. 
This is also how it ended up in the International Commu Committee for Intellectual Cooperation, where Bergson reiterated his points about universal civilization, fraternity, and solidarity that I quoted in the beginning, excluding the Germans, still emphasizing universal culture. During its very first meeting, and as its chairman, Bergson was the chairman of the committee. Nor was this a mere coincidence of that chair of the International Committee for Intellectual Cooperation befalling to Bergson. Bergson's type of internationalism was built into the institution itself. It is true that the International Committee for International Cooperation has become known as a direct precursor to UNESCO, one of the League's technical committees charged with sorting out all kinds of practical problems of learned communication, bibliographic systematics, scholarly exchange schemes, etc. But it was never just that. In fact, the Council of the League of Nations had initially established the committee with no specific task at all. The eminent intellectuals that were appointed as his members, people like Bergson, Albert Einstein, Henrik Lorenz, Marie Curie, um, they were supposed to cut out their work as they pleased themselves. It was open. The main point of the League was that these intellectuals would sit together and embody the idea of a higher civilization, displaying the kind of peaceful cooperation characteristic of that intellectual sphere. They were, in other words, the League's own showcase republic of letters. Bergson recognized this aim, and at the end of the first meeting of the committee, he raised the question whether the idea behind it had been verified or not. Were the committee's members, as representatives of universal civilization, indeed more prone to peace and concord? And did belligerence indeed only rise from barbarity below? His answer was verification. Verification. His experience of the committee's first series of meetings had demonstrated that it is indeed among intellectuals that accord is most easily established. It really feels to me that we are here between friends. Such could only happen among intellectuals. I will conclude. In a recent paper, oh wait, I have one more slide as well. In a recent paper, the scholar Evan Hepler-Smith has argued that the war did so, not so much strip away a veneer of internationalist rhetoric as reorganize the topography of international institutions through which scientists pursued their internationalisms. This perspective, stressing the institutional structure, also helps to understand the discourse in the International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation. It was quite a different institution from pre-war institutions such as, say, Hautelaine La Fontaine's Union des Associations Internationales, whose all-inclusive kind of internationalism could no longer possibly be channeled through the International Com Committee of Intellectual Cooperation, which is not built for that. It had to conduct a different internationalism with a well-defined other, in, in this case, the Austrians and the Germans, an exclusive internationalism, so to speak. At the same time, however, international institutions did not only channel, but also embody particular internationalisms, as Mark Mazauer, for example, has beautifully shown for the League of Nations and the United Nations in tracing their ideological origins, as he calls it. In the case of the International Committee of Intellectual Cooperation, it had been established upon the notion of higher civilization of which purveyors of German culture and its recent barbaric excesses were no longer worthy participants. The scientific internationalism that it represented and that Bergson articulated had the boycott built right into it. And this conclusion, I think, reiterates, but in a sense also resolves the paradox with which I started my paper. Thank you very much. Uh, so the second panel is called Codifying Universalism. Um, I'll introduce our first speaker, um, Teresa Davis, who's a PhD candidate at Princeton. I guess I should introduce myself first. Uh, Peter DeCherney from the, um, from the Cinema Studies program here at Penn. Um, 
really happy to, to, to be here um, introducing our speakers. Um, so Teresa Davis is a PhD candidate at Princeton. Her work on modern Latin America, she works on modern Latin America with an emphasis on intellectual history and US Latin American relations. She's completing a dissertation, The Continent of Peace, Sovereignty, Empire, and Internationalism in Latin America, 1914 to 1939. It explores the idea of sovereignty as it emerged in Latin America in the interwar period. Much of her research is focused on Argentina, uh, where she was recently a Fulbright, and Chile. Uh, her talk today is entitled Universalism at the Margins, Codifying International Law in South America, 1889 to 1930. So I should start by saying I'm a bit of an interloper here. I am not a historian of science. Um, and though I work on international law, I have not, um, at least to myself, I have not qualified my project as a history of knowledge itself. Um, but I have to say it's been extremely helpful as I think about this talk um, to start to frame my project in those terms. Um, and particularly, um, to place knowledge and universalism at the center of my thinking about international law and empire. Um, so with that said, uh, this will be a talk that is based on some very early ideas I've been having about how I might put these different fields together. Um, and so I'd like to use this talk to help me work through some unresolved conundrums I've encountered uh, when thinking about the legal and intellectual history of South America in particular. I want to use the South American case and the case of one jurist to reflect on the relationship between utopian and universalist knowledge and empire. The countries I study, Argentina and Chile, are, depending on our perspectives and our periods, subject to dependency, semi-dependency, informal empire, or neocolonialism. At the same time, throughout both the 19th and 20th centuries, Intellectuals in both places have often resisted writing and thinking through the lens of coloniality. Both countries are marked by strong currents of Europhilia, the myth of the Argentine Paris on the River Plate exists beyond tourist pamphlets in the very layout of the city, as you can see in this photograph of the Argentine Ministry of Foreign Relations. And uh, in yearly trips to the old world, in self-conscious divisions between a Europeanized elite and a self-proclaimedly Creole popular culture. In the late 19th century, Argentine and Chilean intellectuals spent years in exile in Paris and London, even as the French were attempting to establish an imperial outpost in Mexico, and the British were extending their economic dominance over much of South America. The figure at the heart of my talk today is just such a traveler. The Chilean jurist Alejandro Álvarez worked and thought across national and imperial boundaries. He was the preeminent Latin American advocate of turn of the century international law utopianism in a moment when European empires were at their apex and when the United States was itself beginning to join the imperial fray. He preached the gospel of international law at the very moment when fellow international lawyers were using universalistic legal categories to justify the civilizing mission of European and North American empire. He was also incidentally a figure who would later try to uh, lobby Wilson and Colonel House to not enter World War I with his own utopian vision of new world superiority to a decadent Europe, though that will not be the center of the talk today. Alvarez became most famous for the idea of American or sometimes Latin American international law, a concept which on the surface posed a challenge to the epistemic universalism of European international law. As I will discuss momentarily, however, the concept also served the opposite purpose. In promoting the sovereignty of the Latin American states, Alvarez also adopted the very European categories that describes some nations as meritorious and others as uncivilized and thereby unworthy of sovereignty. How then do we understand his ideas? 
In the talk today, I will give uh, first a relatively brief introduction to Alvarez, touching on some of the contemporary interpretive debates over his role as an international lawyer. In my second section, I will talk in more detail about the relationship between empire, universalism, and international law, and will try to situate Alvarez's thought more precisely in the context of turn of the century imperial international law. In my final section, I will offer some thoughts on a potentially different reading of Alvarez. While still in the early phases, I hope these insights and these thoughts will underscore possible ways of getting around the problems that come up when we think about universal ideas from the margins. So, to Alvarez. Alvarez was born in 1868 in northern Chile. Trained in Paris under international lawyers such as Louis Renault and Antoine Pillet, Alvarez imbibed the solidarist international law in vogue in France in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. As a young lawyer, he imbibed the universalistic legal language that dominated French imperial visions. Like his teachers in the Third Republic, he believed that industrial development and the global spread of capitalism would lead to an increasingly complex set of social solidarities. These ties, solidarists thought, would eventually transcend the bounds of the nation state, creating an ever broadening sphere of social independent, interdependence. For many solidarists, the state was merely a functional entity. National law, they thought, would necessarily give way over time to international legal integration, with empires being the primary agents in this process. Alvarez shared classes with prominent theorists of empire, as well as with a cohort of law students who were early advocates of European integration. He would maintain a lifelong friendship, for example, with the French jurist Georges Sell, uh, who was both an ardent defender of French empire and, at the same time, one of the first jurists to argue for Franco-German uh, integration through a European steel and coal community. So, Alvarez networked his way through the institutions of the universalist and utopian age that is the subject of this conference. He was a member of the most important European academies and societies of international law, Many of his most important texts were written and published in France. And here's an example of his uh, text on American international law, which was first published in French. At the same time, um, he turned his focus toward the American continent, and he was a crucial intermediary for the North American foundations, particularly the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, as they attempted to establish ties with Latin American jurists and economists in the early 20th century. Following a brief stint as a legal advisor to the Chilean foreign ministry, Alvarez became one of the most vocal proponents of inter-American cooperation. In the wake of Elihu Root's 1906 visit to South America, he worked to establish ties with North American jurists and policymakers, who he hoped would collaborate in drawing up a legal code for the Americas. In the ensuing years, he became particularly close to the director of the International Law Division at the CEIP, James Brown Scott. Together, the two founded and directed the American Institute of International Law, a CEIP-funded organization for the dissemination of international law in the Western Hemisphere. In conjunction with his counterparts at the Carnegie Endowment's International Law Branch, Alvarez argued that the American region had developed in ways that made it exceptional, the harbinger of a post-imperial international order. This idea appeared in its fullest form in his most famous legal text, Latin America and International Law, which was written in 1909 and published in the Carnegie-funded American Journal of International Law. In this piece, Alvarez argued that the roots of American continental exceptionalism lay in the simultaneous and democratic nature of the American independence movements. European international law resulted from centuries of warfare and intense competition over territory and resources. These problems, Alvarez argued, were absent on a continent rich in natural resources and sparsely populated. This combination of circumstances, he wrote, caused these nations, upon their appearance in the general society of states, 
to exclude from their constitutions the principles of European public law, which did not harmonize with the special character of their organization. At the top of this list of principles were imperial conquest and territorial warfare. As a result of these historical differences, he argued, a new system of international law had emerged on the American continent. It was a form of law designed to govern the equal relationships between 20-odd newly independent nations. Its core tenets were arbitration, non-intervention, and neutrality toward European conflict. In addition to prohibitions on intervention, what Alvarez called American or Latin American international law contained key provisions intended to protect national sovereignty, rules protecting asylum seekers, for example, and procedures governing cross-border disputes over damages owed to foreign citizens and their property. Alvarez devoted much of the period between 1909 and 1933 to writing proposals for the scientific codification of American international law. His ideas were at the heart of Pan-American conferences from the Buenos Aires Conference of 1910 to the Montevideo Conference of 1933. At this last conference, the United States formally committed to an inter-American inter declaration of the rights and duties of states, which Alvarez helped to draft. The latter finally upheld territorial integrity and the right to non-intervention between the states of the Americas, seemingly accepting ideas Alvarez had worked for for decades. As a result of these victories of Latin American international law, the idea has piqued the interest uh, of those contemporary scholars attempting to think outside of the universal categories of European international law. Arnulf Becker Lorca has argued, for instance, that the emergence of what he called mestizo international law traditions posed a fundamental challenge to the universalistic pretensions of late 19th and early 20th century international law. Becker Lorca has even equated Alvarez's work with the modernist anti-imperialism of figures such as the Nicaraguan poet Ruben Darío. On this reading, the claim to represent a distinct American or Latin American international law performed the modernist operation of valorizing the native, the particular, and even in the case of art and poetry, the savage against Eurocentric universalism. Liliana Obregón has likewise described a Creole international law tradition in 19th and early 20th century Latin America. I will talk further down about some concerns I have about this interpretation. In order to do so, however, I want to talk in more detail about the moment in which Alvarez lived and thought, and in particular about the 19th century intertwining of empire and international law. What were the universalist understandings in international law that Alvarez seemingly either upheld or demolished. Below I will talk about the most important of these, to my mind, which has already come up today, the old dichotomy between civilized and uncivilized that has seemed to make its way into even the most enlightened international law traditions. Recent scholarship has shown how the problems at the heart of international law emerged out of the imperial encounter with difference. In the 16th century, the Spanish jurist Francisco de Victoria puzzled over the applicability of European standards to the indigenous Americans with whom, whom Europeans traded and made war. At the center of this debate lay a deeper fight over the question of legal personhood. The answer to this question could cut both ways. Fully adult human persons could alienate their own property through sale, a point central to the westward expansion of the United States. On the other hand, those defined legally as children and even as savages were sometimes granted legal protections, especially by the Spanish crown, that shielded them from the worst ravages of colonization. In either case, the legal framework of the colonial encounter was defined almost entirely by developing European international law categories. As Anthony Yangi has written, international lawyers over the centuries maintained this basic dichotomy between civilized and uncivilized, even while refining and elaborating their understanding of each of these terms. Having established this dichotomy furthermore, Jewish jurists continually developed techniques for overcoming it by formulating legal doctrines directed towards civilizing the uncivilized world. 
I, that is, Angi, use the term dynamic of difference to denote broadly the endless process of creating a gap between two cultures, demarcating one as universal and civilized and the other as particular and uncivilized, and seeking to bridge the gap by developing techniques to normalize the aberrant society. In this way, international law both justified rule over others and encouraged the civilizing mission. It specified the characteristics of civilized society and, in doing so, determined the measures needed to reform the uncivilized one. The deep roots of international law in categories of civilization are particularly evident in the question of determining sovereignty. Who possesses it? Who does not? When may it be abrogated or overthrown? International lawyers' efforts to grapple with the problem of non-European sovereignty became particularly intense in the period in which Alvarez lived and wrote. The late 19th century imperial scramble, unlike earlier informal empire, was accompanied by the new claim that European nations must extend their sovereignty over the people they ruled for both market-driven and humanitarian reasons. The English law scholar John Westlake thus wrote in 1894 that international law has to treat natives as uncivilized. It regulates for the mutual benefit of the civilized states the claims which they make to sovereignty over the region and leaves the treatment of the natives to the conscience of the state to which sovereignty is awarded. The Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885 depicted here though ineffective at quelling inter-imperial struggle, enshrined this doctrine and paved the way for the establishment of European sovereignty on the African continent, most famously in King Leopold's Congo Free State. The international lawyers with whom Alvarez lived and worked in Paris were deeply committed to the project of extending European sovereignty to cover the globe. Their international law utopianism, their belief that progress and peace would only come with global uniformity of laws, was matched, almost always, by their faith that uniformity of laws could only come about as a result of expanding European sovereignty. One might draw parallels here to the expansion of the United States on the American continent. Oh, I seem to be missing a slide. No, there it is a process Alvarez himself watched from up close. While the United States never claimed to exercise sovereignty over most of the countries it occupied, the Monroe Doctrine was increasingly seen to limit the sovereignty of uncivilized or unruly states. In his 1904 Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, uh, Theodore Roosevelt made explicit the relationship between civility and sovereignty. He declared that, quote, if a nation shows that it knows how to act with reasonable efficiency and decency in social and political matters, if it keeps order and pays its obligations, it need fear no interference from the United States. Chronic wrongdoing or an impotence which results in a general loosening of the ties of civilized society may, in America as elsewhere, ultimately require intervention by some civilized nation and, in the Western Hemisphere, the adherence of the United States to the Monroe Doctrine may force the United States however reluctantly, in flagrant cases of such wrongdoing or impotence, to the exercise of an international police power. Between 1904 and the early 1930s, the United States exercised this quote-unquote reluctant power with increasing regularity. Furthermore, the private foundations that Alvarez interfaced with in the United States upheld these views on the exclusive right of the United States to determine when a nation had relinquished its sovereignty. Though they sometimes disagreed on particular instances, such as Woodrow Wilson's Mexico intervention. Furthermore, there was very little in Alvarez's legal philosophy to counter the language of civilization and barbary that undergirded these legal justifications for empire. Indeed, he grafted these categories onto American continental geography, drawing a sharp line between the civilized nations of South America and the unruly ones of the Caribbean basin of the Caribbean and Central America, which he often called the American Lake. He wrote, quote, these states are weak. Internally, they are constantly troubled by civil wars. The claims of European states are numerous, and they are sometimes followed by threats. In failing to manage internal disorder, they threaten the stability of the entire region. By intervening, he continued, the government of the United States thus pursues a noble objective, 
the respect and good name of Latin America. In the 1920s and 30s, other Latin American jurists, such as Mexico's Genaro Estrada, would call for a strict principle of sovereignty not tied to judgment of the political organization of states. Not so Alvarez, who, like contemporaries such as Woodrow Wilson, believed that the purpose of national sovereignty was to advance good political order. Thus, we might take an entirely different view of Alvarez, and some do. For interpreters such as Marty Koskinemi, and more recently, Juan Pablo Scarfi, Alvarez was little more than a cynical apologist for empire. On this view, Alvarez and other quote-unquote peripheral jurists, such as the Greek international joy, uh, lawyer Nikolaos Politis, were opportunists who seized upon the novelty value of advocating the universal from the periphery. In doing so, they made stellar international careers for themselves, substituting a place among European luminaries for defense of the true interests of their respective nations. Koskinemi points out that Alvarez denied even the rights of indigenous Chileans to land possession, thereby accepting the worst of Eurocentric claims about the inferior legal personhood of non-Europeans. In the inter-American context, Scarfi has pointed out that Alvarez provided perhaps the strongest Latin American defense of the Monroe Doctrine by turning it into a principle of multilateral American law. In describing the American continent as a space of equality and non-intervention, Alvarez thus upheld the United States' own imperial ideology, uh, he claims. Scarfi thus argues that the legalist projects of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and especially their co-optation of jurists like Alvarez, were hegemony-building enterprises in which, in the first part of the 20th century, they were spectacularly successful. Yet this view of Alvarez as an imperial apologist is also unsatisfying, um, as unsatisfying as the portrait of him as a legal revolutionary, to use a rather strange term. Alvarez was clearly not an anti-colonial nationalist avant la lettre, but so much of his writing was devoted to distinguishing sovereign American states from bellicose European empires that it would seem important to account for both aspects of his thought, the imperialist and the justifier of intervention. So now briefly to close, I want to propose a slightly different approach to interpreting Alvarez. Most simply, I want to argue that Alvarez was both an anti-imperialist and a justifier of civilized interventionism because he himself was articulating his own alternative universalism. Like other South American elites in the same moment, he was justifying the emergence of a newly powerful Chilean state and arguing for its place in international society in universalistic terms. This was not, in a word, so very different from the bizarre combination of democratic idealism, colonial expansionism, and anti-imperialism being articulated in the United States in the same period. To rethink Alvarez, I draw loosely on Frederick Cooper's insights about the distinctiveness of late 19th century imperialism. It was, he argued, the imperialism of an industrial world carried out by a bourgeois class whose signature characteristic was to present its own experience in universal terms. Cooper's call to re-emphasize the class basis of imperialism also had a second corollary, which was that if we look more closely at classes and class cultures, the boundaries between colonizer and colonized, or to say it slightly more awkwardly, imperialist and imperialized, become far less clear. In the introduction to his colonial cultures in a bourgeois world, he thus called for a new scholarship to, quote, explore within the shared but differentiated space of empire the hierarchies of production, power, and knowledge that emerged in tension with the extension of the domain of universal reason, of market economics, of citizenship. Back to Alvarez, apart from being a mobile, transient, and traveling global intellectual, Alvarez was also a member of a national guild of lawyers tasked with writing law for a particular state. This state was in the process of consolidating new forms of economic and social control, and even in the case of his native Chile, 
carrying out its own project of colonization against its neighbors, Peru and Bolivia. Argentina, Chile, and Brazil had all experienced extraordinarily rapid growth in the last third of the 19th century. As a result, the era of, U of European universalism was also one in which South American elites imagined that they too would join the ranks of civilized international society. As they colonized their hinterlands and consolidated their national states in the period after 1880, South American elites developed their own universalizing visions which justified the expansion of new forms of social and economic control. The writings of Argentina's famed political theorist and constitutional lawyer, Juan Bautista Alberdi, provide an example of how the imperatives of state building could lead, as they had in the United States and elsewhere, to new ideologies premised on the singular nature of new world development. In the case of Argentina, the core of this ideology was emptiness. Like the United States, Argentina was a land of empty people, empty of people, excuse me. And as a result of empty, emptiness, openness to foreign immigration and foreign capital. To govern is to populate, Alberti wrote, in the sense that to populate means to educate, to improve, to civilize, to enrich, and to expand spontaneously and rapidly. It also meant, he continued, that the Americas would have to take the best from Europe to promote the immigration of Europe's most civilized and hardworking elements and to foment vast influxes of European capital and expertise. He wrote a constitution for Argentina that emphasized openness toward both people and capital, birthright citizenship rather than old world nationality, for instance, and provisions protecting the free navigation of national waterways. Like contemporaries in the United States, Alberti presented Argentina as both the inheritor of the European tradition and as the purveyor of a new universalism based on democratic sovereignty and the peaceful globalization of capital. For Alberti, the new world, with Argentina at its center, was both geography and political ideal, a post-imperial democratic space governed by sweet commerce rather than force. Alvarez's own trajectory provides compelling, compelling parallels. Before becoming an internationally renowned lawyer, Alvarez was a legal advisor to the Chilean foreign ministry. During much of the first six years of his career, he worked primarily on cases arising out of Chile's annexation of large portions of southern Bolivia and Peru during the War of the Pacific. The cases are a fascinating example of the complexities of international domination. Chile, for decades, had refused a just settlement to the conflict and had profited richly from acquisition of resource-rich reasons to the north. The war left Peru and Bolivia crippled, uh, and Bolivia was permanently severed from the sea as a consequence, consequence of the conflict. At the same time, immediately following the war, Chile was assailed by a deluge of mostly spurious claims from foreign investors who claimed that the country was responsible for damages to private property sustained during the conflict or for the re repayment of debts contracted with the Bolivian and Peruvian governments. The United States and Britain each became involved in diplomatic claims making against the Chilean state. And the largest of these claims were subjected to arbitration, often with the British crown as arbiter. In resolving these cases, Alvarez developed a series of concerns that would guide him throughout his career. Crucially, he was unbothered by the colonial aspects of the case which he treated in the rather bland language of sovereignty transfer. What worried him most was the problem of jurisdiction. He understood the rash of claims making not as the result of imperial attacks on Chilean sovereignty, but rather as the result of a legal irrationality that could be resolved through more codification. In the future, he argued, Chile and other South American countries must establish clear jurisdiction over foreign companies. For this to be effective, the procedures for determining this jurisdiction needed to be internationally agreed, with each government agreeing to allow its citizens to process claims through foreign courts before intervening. It was through these complex cases that Alvarez began to elaborate what would later become Latin American international law. At the heart of his early writings was the conundrum of Latin America's openness to foreign capital and immigration the question of how to both maintain openness and protect state sovereignty 
led Alvarez, like Alberdi, to advocate birthright citizenship and laws requiring that foreign corporations incorporate in their country of operation. Moreover, it led him to argue for arbitration and non-intervention agreements. Neither was rooted in anti-imperialism or in a moralistic understanding of the international economy. This was, instead, a vision of law designed to smooth the flow of capital by eliminating the possibility of conflict. But from this pragmatic struggle over property and state building, Alvarez also constructed a sweeping new world utopia based on Pacific commercial integration, the rule of law, arbitration, and openness to immigration and capital. I'm going to skip the last section where I talked a little bit more about how these ideas were codified in the late 19th century. Um, there were a series of extremely innovative conferences in uh, the 1880s and 1890s through which Latin America codified uh, what is known as private international law. Um, and this became the basis of Alvarez's idea of Latin American international law. So skipping that part, um, to finish, um, the thrust of Latin American international law was not to contest European public order, but rather to present the new world as the inheritor of Europe's leadership and as the site of its global future. Alvarez was prescient. World War I did reorder the world around new world ideologies and new world power. The ascendancy of the United States, however, eclipsed, eclipsed South American visions for continental reorganization. Yet it bears remembering, uh, especially in this conference, that figures like Alvarez entered universal and universalizing organizations, bearing their own alternative universalisms. To moralize Alvarez by constricting him to categories of resistor or collaborator is to ignore the history of his own failed attempt to impose a universal order on the world. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is uh, uh, Eva Hemmings uh, Worden, a professor at Linköping University in Sweden. Uh, she's the author of the books No Trespassing, Terms of Use, Making Marie Curie, Intellectual Property, and Celebrity Culture in an Age of Information. Uh, she's been working on a new book about patents and public knowledge, which has been supported in part by a fellowship from the Chemical Heritage Foundation here in Philadelphia. Uh, I've known Eva for a long time as a, a fellow member of the executive committee of, the, of ISHTIP, the International Society for the History and Theory of Intellectual Property, and I'm happy to, uh, to say that she's the newly minted co-director of that organization. Her talk today is entitled, A Dangerous Utopia, The Curious Case of Scientific Property. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to the uh, organizers for inviting me. I should say that my passage through immigration was faster than ever. Go figure. I, I don't know why, but there it is. <laughs> In the first week of August 1922, the League of Nations newly formed Commission Internationale de Coopération Intellectuelle, henceforth simply the Commission, descended on Geneva for their inaugural meeting. Five days of discussion awaited the nine men and two women who represented the best of the best minds Europe, because this was nothing if not a Eurocentric uh, group, had to offer. Albert Einstein, absent from that first meeting, but depicted here at a later time with fellow members Marie Curie, Robert Milliken, and Gilbert Murray, completed the preeminent roster approached to serve in an advisory capacity to the League's Assembly and Council in all matters relating to intellectual cooperation. Their mission, ensuring that something so incongruous as a great war never repeated itself. Of course, there already existed an organization dealing with many of the same topics that the Commission now would approach. And it was headquartered in Brussels, where Henri Lafontaine and Paul Hortley, for more than 25 years, had worked together in the name of pacifism and internationalism. By the time of that inaugural Commission meeting in Geneva, the two collaborators oversaw an entire portfolio of initiatives that were all pro prominently international in nature. The International Office of Bibliography, the International Archives, the International Library, etc., etc. It was as if the expanding world of information was held together from Brussels. Or maybe not, the League of Nations wasn't altogether convinced about the whole holding together capacity of the two Belgian collaborators. 
certainly utopian in their thinking, perhaps it was all a bit too utopian for the liking of the League of Nations, even though they had previously sponsored Otley and La Fontaine financially as well as morally. But the relationship between Brussels and Geneva was strained. Few countries are less cosmopolitan, Otley once quipped about Switzerland. The League of Nations, for their part, appear to have viewed the Belgian collaborators as unstructured amateurs whose financial situation was always precarious. There's little doubt that the work of the Commission, the interwar period in general, and definitely Otley La Fontaine's whole oeuvre, fit nicely um, in the context uh, of a symposium of this kind. They also come together in one of the chapters in my most recent book, Making Marie Curie, from 2015. So the cha that chapter in particular relates to Curie's, um, Curie's relationship uh, to the Commission, her work in the Commission, and Otley and La Fontaine also prefigure in that story. And this, it's this chapter that is the basis of my talk here today. Through all of these years, however, my interest has been and continues to be on intellectual property mostly copyright, but with the Curie book, I've started to become more interested in patents, and I sometimes pronounce it patents and sometimes patents, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, primarily, the dynamic of the patent bargain, let's see if it works now, and the relationship to publication and disclosure, so expressed here by Judge Newman as, the study of patented information is essential to the creation of new knowledge, thereby achieving further scientific and technological progress. So my own research in the future continues to be on intellectual property and especially patents as part then of the sciences of information. Today, I'm revisiting work then I did a few years ago, but from a slightly different angle that simply comes with the passing of time. So in about 22 minutes from now, I'll wrap up with a few ideas on where one might go uh, in future research on intellectual property within a context such as this one. But in preparation of that ending, I'd like to leave you uh, with a few thoughts. So consider this image by Otley, or rather commissioned by him from 1940, so a relatively late um, image, entitled Laboratorium Mundaneum. Not only is it one of my favorite uh, Otley images, uh, I've taken it as point of departure for my new project and how we might understand patents as documents. Because as you can see in this image, patents are explicitly identified as one top in the mountain range of documents that is modern information. Patents are different, yet they are subjected to the same treatment as all other documents, at least according to Otley. So that's one perspective I'm interested. Another one, very briefly, is I think that from the perspective of intellectual property and legal history more generally, there's a lot to be done uh, on Otley and La Fontaine's uh, work more generally. We've already heard that they were trained as lawyers and they met while working uh, on a, uh, Edmond Picard's famously monumental 150 volume Pandect Belge. So there is this legal history, I think, that runs through um, Otley and La Fontaine's work, which is really underexplored in a way. But more than anything in that perspective, as this documentary universe grows, it does so through networks of expertise that transcend science proper, the science of bibliography and the law, and especially then, I would argue, patents and patent offices. Patent, I'm really fascinated by patent offices. So in the work I'm doing now, I ask, what sort of history of law, science, and information will we have if we follow patents, not down a rabbit hole, but down Otley's black grinder? Slowly but surely, during 10 meetings that week in August 1922, the Commission came to identify a number of key areas they felt were in need of specific attention. Three of them were important enough to warrant the formation of separate sub-commissions. Um, Inter-university relations is pretty straightforward, let's skip that. So I'll concentrate uh, on the two others, bibliography and intellectual property, or scientific property um, especially. Work on the first was needed because, as the Commission noted, the International Organization for Scientific Documentation, particularly bibliography, is essential for all intellectual uh, co uh, cooperation. 
It was to be a task led by Marie Curie and Gilles Destre, which was the, he was the Belgian ex-minister of arts and sciences. So this was a job that seemed tailor-made for Otley, <laughs> but Destre uh, would represent Belgium and he um, would work together with Curie in this uh, subcommission on bibliography. Work on the second, intellectual property, an issue that initially had been inconspicuous enough to fall into the quagmire of miscellaneous questions, received a noticeable upgrade during the week. In fact, the Commission concluded that intellectual property in general is not sufficiently safeguarded by existing legislation, and scientific property is not safeguarded at all. Now, knowing what we know today of how modern intellectual property has developed during the past decades, this kind of certitude has a nice and quaint vibe to it. But the Commission didn't stop there. In the matter of scientific discoveries, they suggested, it should be held that the idea itself is entitled to be safeguarded and not merely the application of the idea. So trying to roll back protection so far in the creative process as to somehow propertize the discovery of a naturally occurring element, such as, say, radium, was unheard of in the practices of existing intellectual property law and was one of the reasons why scientific property then would catapult into a long-standing controversy. At first blush, the work of the two subcommittees seems unrelated, pursued on separate tracks then, that slotted, in a sense, scientific disinterestedness or rather open dissemination of access to knowledge into one, an equally conventional interest, read intellectual property into the other. Now, this separation is famously described by Marie Curie in one of the very few texts where she talked about the work she and her husband had done. It was in the biography of her husband, Pierre, published first in the United States, actually, and then in France. It has a very complicated publishing history, which goes beyond what I have time to talk about here. There she writes, our investigations had started a general scientific movement and similar work was being undertaken in other countries. Toward these efforts, Pierre Curie maintained the most disinterested and liberal attitude. With my agreement, he refused to draw any material profit from our discovery. We took no copyright and published without reserve all the results of our research, as well as the exact processes of the preparation of radium. In addition, we gave to those interested whatever information they asked of us. This was a great benefit to the radium industry, which could thus develop in full freedom, first in France, then in foreign countries, and furnish to scientists and to physicians the products which they needed. This industry still employs today, with scarcely any modifications, the processes indicated by us. Now, this is not the time nor the place to go into the details on how this text ended up the way it did in Pierre Curie, what importance the I and the me and the we and the our had to the consolidation of scientific authority and autonomy. Suffice to say that a lot of interest uh, went into the production of disinterestedness. Twenty years after the fact, and actually pretty much at the same time as her involvement in the Commission begins, Marie Curie made it very clear that choosing to publish without reserve was absolutely distinct from keeping advantage through intellectual property. Of course, this separation of publishing and patenting in Pierre Curie was a bit more complicated than Marie Curie made it out to be. We know, for instance, that Pierre Curie had patented several instruments that brought him an extra income that was far from negligible. And while the ethos of the scientific community of the time may have been towards openness and publication, certainly patenting was becoming increasingly important. The work on bibliography and intellectual property um, undertaken by the Commission made sense ideologically because they were of concern to a very particular individual, which was also a collective, of course, the intellectual worker. This worker, however, could, would, and needed to organize because as one French representative uh, of the movement put it, it wasn't just a certain education that united the specialists in commerce and industry, lawyers, men of science, authors and artists, those whom society has to thank for its ideas, aesthetics, intellectual and economic methods, law and order. It is the feeling of uh, assuming together the initiative of progress. There was a strong feeling among certain groups during the interwar years that intellectuals and scientists certainly belonged in this group had not received the recognition or reward they merited for their outstanding contributions to society. 
So bibliography, economizing and um, doc uh, documenting scientific work and scientific property, controlling and rewarding scientific work became a sort of common front from the Commission. Even though the subcommittee on bibliography would sometimes feel that their work was bogged down by an unwillingness to cooperate that Marie Curie found very frustrating, the necessity for increased international collaboration on bibliography and documentation was largely uncontested. The idea of scientific property, on the other hand, would compensate for such consensus by proving extremely controversial. And as many times before in the history of international intellectual property relations, the inspiration came from France. In the spring of 1920, the French droit d'auteur had been revised to include a droit de suite, a form of resale right guaranteeing artists a certain percentage on the profits made on the resale of a painting. It was an attempt to compensate for the fact that too many artists, and France could congratulate herself on having plenty of them, lived in abject poverty um, while creating their masterpieces and then had to sell these for a pittance before they most likely died destitute. Descendants faced similarly depressing prospects, suffering in silence while the paintings in question continued to make money, much money, when sold on to collectors or galleries. This was one of the images uh, within that movement, so there's this impoverished child seeing her father's painting sold at auction. As might be inferred from the scenario described above, the droit de suite was a subset of droit moral, that particular aspect of French copyright law safeguarding the inalienable, even perpetual, moral integrity of the author and the work. Just as inalienable, the droit de suite had the same cutoff date when it came to legatees. It was in effect until 50 years after the death of the artist. Jules Destré, who actually then had a hand in all three subcommittees, had in fact initiated work on a Belgian droit de suite already in 1913, work that was aborted because of the war. All of these ideas provided background material for the Commission's own report on scientific property, written by the Italian Senator Francesco Ruffini and dated September 1st, 1923. Why was it so controversial and what were its main elements? Well, the ideological foundation was a form of droit de suite for scientists, a royalty on all industrial or commercial exploitation of their discoveries. Ruffini argued that by innovators and artists were both catered to by patents and droit d'auteur, there was no legal protection at present for the savant who discovers a truth from which mankind in extension will draw the greatest and most durable advantages. Scientists were simply unseen by the law. They were truly invisible men. The general objections against bringing them and their discoveries into the legal limelight were the same, Ruffini argued, as those once made in respect to copyright. Like the sciences, art was also cumulative and collectively constructed. The same thing could be said about innovation. The Commission then remained convinced that justice in the shape of scientific property had to be achieved the same way earlier international conventions and in intellectual property had, that is, the multilateral way. Since the Paris and Bern unions and conventions from 1883 and 1886 respectively, there had been a dual conceptualization of intellectual property and a double administrative apparatus of convention management, journals and conferences. The fact that the international community had managed to expand these conventions to accommodate new technologies and new rights told the Commission that there was no reason why future revisions could not do the same for the hitherto unknown entity of scientific property. Perhaps even at the upcoming Bern Revision Conference in Rome, scheduled for 1928. Ruffini and the Commission wanted a new union and they wanted a new convention in the shape of a legal hybrid, in a way, between copyright and patents. Ruffini claimed that the scheme was different from prizes and awards and distinct from patronage because it offered payment for services rendered, a more modern, at the same time more dignified way of doing things, as he also put it. Still, it was altogether unclear what sort of scheme the Commission had before them. Was it a new kind of moral right or was it a new kind of property right? The conceptual model of having the very French droit de savant over their works or scientific discoveries subsumed under what sounded more like a common law property regime 
did not make things any easier. Maybe it was just a reward system rather than a legal regime. But if it was something more along the lines of a redistribution scheme, a form of taxation, how would this operate under the given parameters of the nation state vis-a-vis -vis the Paris and Bern multilateral treaties? How would disputes be handled and by whom? Questions were piling up. Nobody knew the answers. Perhaps a sign of things to come, the first objection originated from within the Commission itself, and it was written by the US delegate John Henry Wigmore. It targeted paragraph three, the scope of the right. The draft convention stipulated that protectable subject matter included discoveries, that is, exposés and demonstrations of hitherto unknown laws, principles, bodies, agents or properties of living creatures or matter and innovations, that is, creations of the mind. Even though the law had not always recognized the distinction between discovery and invention, this was the very baseline of modern, the modern patent system. And Ruffini himself noted that in 1923, there was not a legal system around that did not exclude discovery from protection. During the coming years, years spent trying to tweak the untweakable proposal into a sellable proposition, the subcommittee would send out requests for uh, comments and receive suggestions from the international community. Governments replied with lukewarm attention or outright hostility. The critique against scientific property would simply not go away, and it developed along a very familiar axis in intellectual property history. United States and the UK on one side, and France and her allies on the other. The French considered the Anglo-American contingent part-time internationalists, often dull, sometimes crass. The Anglo-American contingent considered the French hopeless philosophers without any sense of reality. Scientific property only widened an already existing rift between the two. Scientific property wasn't the Commission's only headache, um, and, and, it would, and it would stay a headache even when the Commission moved to France, I think in 1926, a new administrative seat in Paris. But it was viewed with greater sympathy, I think, in France and anywhere else. Still, it's difficult to see how such an ostracized proposal managed to stay afloat for so many years. Even Curie, living symbol of disinterested science, endorsed what she, Langevin, Borel, and other French scientists perhaps saw as a scheme of remuneration, not propertization. The droit de savant might not have seemed contradictory to Curie for the simple reason that she never saw it as a property regime, but as a redistribution of profits. However, incompletely and futile, she saw reward for the creative moment, the discovery, shifting focus from innovation and industry to discovery and creative spark. But if it was just a scheme of remuneration, one might ask if there was ever any intention of making the droit de savant into reality. Maybe it was all intended to force the hand of the state, to push for new funding schemes for research, a new national plan for supporting science. Curie would not live to see her oldest daughter, Irene, appointed Under Secretary of State for Scientific Research by the French government in 1936, nor would she benefit from the CNRS, the major French research funding body. Irene Joliot Curie helped launch in 1939, perhaps the result Curie always wanted when she promoted that impossible thing of scientific property. What is it then, uh, moving towards the end of this talk, what is it then in scientific property that is so interesting or that might be explored further? Well, from my perspective as an intellectual property scholar, this is a moment where things seem possible. <laughs> and, and legal hybridity I find quite interesting. So there's this idea that we can cherry pick something from copyright and we can take something from patents and then we can do something, something new. And I find that quite interesting um, how that should go about. The other thing is, is there a time when intellectual, today we think of intellectual property as dystopia. And I mean, they do too at this time, but there's also this idea that property is part of a utopian uh, way of accessing knowledge. And I find that quite, quite interesting. And of course, we still have that. We have, in a sense, the utopian idea of a European patent that we actually do have now. So there's been a, a kind of u utopian movement within intellectual property too, which I think is totally under-researched in a way. And the final thing is for giving better descriptions of the way that we live now, and this is uh, 
taking out a piece from a quote by, uh, by Stephen Shapin on why we do, why, what, what history helps us do. And I think scientific property, in a sense, we perceive of it as a failure, but was it really a failure? I mean, we could say that we have scientific property today, ever from the Beidou Act <laughs> up until today. So, um, but it's a way of mirroring what's happening today and understanding it better, perhaps. So, to wrap up then, let's return to Otley's Laboratorium Mundaneum from 1940, where patents then are on par with articles, reviews, books, correspondence, and statistics. It's very clear, and I just hinted at this in the beginning, in the history of Otley and Lafontaine's work, when the EEB moves to Holland under the stewardship of Duncan Davis, who was head of the Dutch Patent Office, if I remember correctly, there's a reinforcement, I would argue, of the patent history in Otley and Lafontaine's work, which is really quite interesting. And Garfield has already been mentioned, he also worked at the Patent Office. So there is a patent history or patent office history in this um, trajectory, I would argue. As the documents are transported from the different peaks into the black grinder, the great global intellectual machinery, which then extracts pure matter useful for civilizations. So what civilization, once processed and sorted, there's this small train that exits from under the grinder, carrying the purified matter now numbered according to Otley and Lafontaine's classification system, CDU. So not only do we have here true industrialization of information, we also have actually differences erased in the machine. Um, so they come out on the train and they sort of, there's something in that that is streamlined. So if we manage to come out of the black grinder on the train, what sort of history of law, science and information might you have? Well, one possible answer is that looking at patents as documents means following a paper trail a trail that we can also follow from the perspective of media history or media archaeology. So there's the materiality to this paper trail in a sense. To consider patents as documents within the structures of the information age is to consider also how they produce their own administrative and expertise communities, how they straddle the constant dilemma of the national and international, and how they became dependent on systems of classification, sorting, and ordering. Indeed, how they became, to paraphrase <coughs> Jerome McGann, every bit the social texts that they are. As I hinted at before, there are several reasons why we should bother with patents. One is that they make emotions run high, and they have for more than a century. Uh, perhaps more so than any other intellectual property, they epitomized an intellectual property regime gone berserk. And while historians of science and book historians have dedicated considerable time unpacking the workings of the scientific journal and article in all its institutional and informational makeup, parallel readings of patents as text, information, and documents are far scarce. In contrast to the importance they are assigned in a knowledge-based economy, and despite being possibly the oldest intellectual property we have, the history of patents as information has yet, in a sense, to be written. The Latin patere means to lay open. It might sound counterintuitive, but we know then that openness is constitutive of the patent bargain or the underlying rationale stipulating disclosure of information in return for a limited monopoly. The consolidation of patents into a contractual relationship rather than a thing of privilege coalesces then in the Republican idea that disclosure generates further innovation through enablement. I'm acutely aware of the fact that very few, including myself, primarily then associate patents with this original ideology of openness. Instead, the rent-collecting demons known as patent trolls and the impenetrable layers of counterproductive patent thickets have come to illustrate everything that has gone haywire in the intellectual property system. I want to suggest, however, that the openness disclosure of patents may provide us with a new perspective on how we ended up with the trolls and the thickets. But disclosure is complex, and it cannot quite be understood if we don't look at the same time on non-disclosure and silence. So patents tell us something, and in that process, patents tell us something new about the value and power of information across seminal distinctions between pure and applied, open and enclosed, between secrecy and disclosure. Um, and thinking back on Curie's distinctions, the parallel work of the Commission, I think it's essential that they are understood in relation to publishing or making open or 
um, because while those two options are but two in a whole range of options available to scientists, they have been and continue to be absolutely central to the way science and research work. The push and pull between sciences publishing and sciences patenting is not only second nature to higher education and research in the 21st century, but provide constant fuel to the metrics culture that underpins it. So, in my final image, look at the website of the École Supérieure de Physique et de Chimie Industrielle de la Ville de Paris, known to some by its Anglo-American name, ESPC Paris Tech, a bastion of French scientific excellence and the very place where the discovery of radium took place. So this is where Marie and Pierre Curie in a derelict shed, now torn down, um, discovered radium in 1898. On its website, ESPCE markets itself by connecting and quantifying the production of its scientific outputs. By publishing one article daily in the best international scientific journals, the teachers and researchers of the school construct the knowledge of tomorrow. And by depositing one patent weekly, they invent the industry of the future. Assign different roles, constructing the knowledge of tomorrow by publishing versus inventing the industry of the future by depositing patents, the balance then between the two outputs is a weekly seven to one. Now putting aside any possible objections on the logic whereby articles slash patents are the self-evident providers um, of future knowledge and innovation, what should we make of the seven to one ratio? Bizarre, totally misrepresentative, or simply a fact of life? Well, probably all of the above. One thing is for sure, where once you could perish for not publishing, you can now expect to suffer the same fate for not patenting. Thank you. Thank you, Eva and Teresa. So we have time for a few questions. See with. Uh, so uh, this is for Teresa. Uh, I, I'm curious about uh, the role of Brazil in particular in the late 19th century and something you didn't say, which was slavery, which seems to be relevant to how international law will be codified and is still extant when Brazil is part of this internationalization of a universal rule and is distinctly un-European at that moment. So how does that fit into the narrative you give a little bit later? Maybe I can just, oops. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the real answer to that question is that I've spent a lot of time developing very articulate linguistic techniques for leaving Brazil out of my dissertation because it's such a complicated case. Um, what I would say is, is by the time um, most of this is taking place, Brazil has abolished slavery, and Brazilian intellectuals like Joaquim Nabucco, who, who were opposed to slavery, are some of the most um, prominent voices in the Pan-American movement. He actually, I, th I think, dies at the first Pan-American conference in Washington. It's this sort of symbolic moment. Um, and so that's, it, it's sort of, the limit of what I have to say about Brazil and slavery in this moment, but I, I think um, eventually it would be really interesting to write a history of, especially of Brazilian anti-slavery and the Pan-American movement. Uh, the scientific property hybrid thing that arises in the 20s, it seems the, the savants that I noticed you mentioning were mostly physicists and chemists. Yeah. And is that generally the sort of, the, the people involved in this, was it indeed something that was happening at that intersection? Where I, I imagine at the time, a lot of the savants who were patenting were often indeed physicists and chemists rather than yeah. people. So scientific property, you could imagine how it might conceivably work if you're a physicist or mm. a certain kind mm. of physicist. But if you are a natural historian, zoologist, you know, finding species yeah. here and there. It's just, I can't, you can't, it's, it's just inconceivable in some sense yeah. how that would work. So is that, how did it, how did the disciplinary I, map on? I don't know enough about different, but, but it's very clear. I mean, Langevin has lots of patents and was involved in, in, in different, uh, I think, 
troublesome cases as well. So it seems to me that the group that is very much pushing for scientific property in France is this particular group. So I'm sure you're right that, you know, there are other segments of science that is not at all interested, perhaps, or, or much less interested. I mean, there's a great, there's a controversy when Curie goes, she goes, she's in the, um, this is uh, the Academy of Les Médecins, I mean, for, for medicine. She's in the, one of the academies, and she's trying to make a case for intellectual property. And it's seen as very controversial, and it's basically shot down. So yes, I think, you know, it, it, it was a controversial suggestion, even in France, depending on what, what, where you came from in the scientific community, certainly. Um, but again, I, I, I don't think she saw it. I mean, she might have, but... I mean, she's clearly pitching it in a very French way as a sort of right, you know, that we have the right to be sort of remunerated or rewarded in a sense for this work that we've put into it. So there seems to me to be this distinction between property and right, which is, of course, you know, the French and American differences. That's a really interesting idea. Um, new intellectual property, both patents and copyright, they constantly expand to new fields, mm. places you don't, they were never initially thought of. And maybe it's about a kind of um, lack of imagination or expansion of imagination in different kinds of fields. Yeah. I like yeah. that idea a lot. Yeah. Uh, sort of a similar question. Was there any relationship, as far as you've been able to tell, between the um, ICIC discussions of scientific property and contemporaneous debates about patenting organisms and patenting life? were very alive, as I understand it. You mean during, in the commission? No. Um, either in no. the commission or by any, uh, I mean, are these just entirely sort of... I haven't, I haven't come that across yet. that, certainly not now, and I haven't. This is also to Eva, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just wondering, there's an older notion of the Republic of Letters mm. that m makes it look different from other communities by the very fact that its members are not in it for the money, mm. so to speak, right? They, they, they are a special community transcending the nations, etc. Mm -hmm. but also marking you know, different from commercial communities, etc., yeah. because what they produce is a gift, is a gift to humankind, right? It, it's not owned. No. Um, now, it seems to me that in the 20s, some of these notions were still a little bit alive, uh, yet in the Committee for International Cooperation, mm. they seem to be working on the opposite. Mm. W was, was there, did I feel a tension there? Did I feel like we're... We're becoming a different sort of entity now. You mean about the gift economy, or are we transcending the, the property economy, if you will? Well, I think they're both certainly alive. I'm not sure if it's as easy as I tried to describe it, that, you know, the, the, the old gift economy sort of slotted into the biography <laughs> subcommittee and, and the property um, concerns are slotted into the scientific property, because I think the whole point is that there are overlaps between the two all the time, so that these interests sort of you know, crossover. Um, I, I'm not, that's not a very good answer to your question, but, but I think for, if I can use Curie as an example of, of the gift and the, and the property sort of arguments that she makes during the 1920s, it's very clear that her work in the United States, when she travels to the United States to receive the gift of one gram of radium from, you know, the women of the United States, this is certainly a gift. And it's extremely important that it be seen as a gift, although, of course, there's lots of money involved in giving her it. I mean, America's women has collected, you know, what today is worth um, similar to a Nobel Prize in order to give her a gram of radium. But, but for the construction of herself as a scientific um, authority, I mean, she sort of covers different tracks, and one of the tracks is certainly give the gift economy as very strong and, and as very important to the way in which she is perceived as an authority. But on the other hand, she's sort of also pursuing this idea of scientific property as a way of perhaps remunerating or strengthening the finances of research. So I think it's, I mean, I'm not sure if she's a good example, because, but, but I mean, she certainly has this double you know, way of navigating through, through this. Depending on what I think, 
she gains from it in in a sense, or what may may you know what is best for her in a sense. Okay, well, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.